All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm Wei Xiong. Uh, I'll be chairing the session. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the next speaker, uh, Oscar Jordan uh, from Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So he will talk about uh, betting the house. Right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is work with uh, my user collaborators, Mark Chularik at the University of Bonn and Alan Taylor at Davis, which I am also affiliated with. Yesterday, uh, Marcus said, oh, so you're uh, presenting on behalf of the Troika. And I said, uh, uh, Marcus, that's not really a very good term for us. <laughs> I would rather use the term three musketeers. Uh, it's a less fraught term. But anyway, uh, let me give away the paper. Uh, so I hope that by the end of the talk, you have three takeaways to take with you. Uh, and this is going to be based on uh, a research that we've been doing in a number of years by collecting data primarily on credit and different categories of credit. And I have to confess that personally it has been an eye-opening experience. I think this is one of the pieces of research where I actually think I have something to say to my fellow human beings that might be of interest, in, interest to them. So let me tell you what you should take away from this talk today. Uh, issue number one is that mortgages have become an increasing share in bank lending in all advanced economies over the last, primarily over the last half century. And that I think has important consequences from the point of view of the discussion that we're having about inequality. I will try to discuss how that might matter. That along with increasing home ownership rates. The second takeaway is that we are currently, uh, especially now that I am in a policy instit uh, institution, uh, we are at the horns of a dilemma in the sense that on the one hand, you want to have loose policy to stimulate economic activity to uh, make the economy come out of the financial crisis a little bit more easily. On the other hand, there's the fear that you'll be stoking the next housing bubble. And so one of the uh, contributions of our research is going to try to think quantitatively how much the risk, are, are those risks, okay? Uh, so I'm going to talk about how you should think about each of those elements. And finally, uh, what I'd like to discuss a little bit is the interplay between um, house prices, mortgage lending activity, and the likelihood of financial crisis, which you could imagine is also another great source of preoccupation from the point of view of policy. Now, what are the policy implications of these three broad areas or three broad questions that uh, I'm going to discuss? Well, I think one of the things that you saw in Gabriel's presentation uh, is that more and more, the lower layers of the income distribution are experiencing higher and higher leverage. And uh, basically, there's a trickling down of credit risk. And credit risk is trickling down basically to those layers of the income distribution that are uh, least well equipped to deal with. And this connects very well with the research that Atif and his co-author Amir uh, have been doing in, in their book. <laughs> Uh, and it connects very well with their uh, notion of how we should structure mortgages, mortgage contracts, and how should we think about those resharing mechanisms. So I'd like you to have that in the back of your mind as I discuss what has happened with uh, mortgages. But more broadly, I'd like you to also think about how should we think about the treatment of mortgages from a policy point of view, not only in terms of fiscal policy, should we be uh, basically subsidizing uh, home ownership through mortgage interest rates deductions, but what role should uh, housing authorities have in providing insurance for lenders and all those things that uh, have been at the forefront of the debate in recent times. The second uh, sort of implication for policy that I'd like to discuss is, is, is this dilemma that we face. On the one hand, we have to stimulate the economy to come out of the crisis. On the other hand, we want to be very well aware of, of what the consequences of, of that stimulus uh, are going to be for uh, uh, the likelihood of uh, stoking another housing bubble. Okay, let me show you some broad trends that I don't think many of us knew about until we actually collected data and started to look at the macrofinancial history of the last 150 years nearly 
and uh, spelled out across all advanced economies that we can get our hands on. So what I'm showing in this graph is what has happened uh, for 17 advanced economies in terms of credit alone. And so the, the variable that you have plotted there is bank lending as a ratio to GDP. And if you could visually draw a line to the half of that uh, graph, you'd see two very different eras. In the first part of that graph, uh, what you would see is a relatively stable relationship between bank lending and GDP with a lot of turmoil created by World War I, the Great Depression, and then World War II. After World War II, what you see really is an incredible increase in the amount of bank lending as a ratio to GDP. That really is an unprecedented trend that I don't think we were very aware of uh, until we actually plotted this data. Um, it especially takes off, although it's not very obvious from that graph, uh, after the fall of Bretton Woods. I may, I may have something to say about that if I have time. So that's one takeaway to keep in the back of your mind. So bank lending has gone up dramatically, but where has it been going up toward? And the issue is it has been going a lot toward mortgages. Now, there's a lot of nuance in that statement because, uh, you know, in a sense, there was a lot of, uh, you could imagine, mortgage activity that was not taking place in banks in the early parts of our data housing societies and things of that nature, and a lot of that was brought into the banking system proper. On the other hand, in more modern times, we had kind of the opposite uh, situation. A lot of mortgages have been securitized and sold off uh, of banks' balance sheets. But if you again draw that imaginary line uh, and divide the graph into two halves, what you see is that prior to 1950, there's a fairly stable relationship between the share of lending in banks loan books, which is about uh, 30 to 35 percent, and nowadays, which is about twice uh, that amount. And again, if you uh, look at what has happened in the last 20 or 30 years, what you see is a much, much more rapid increase of, of that share of, of, of loans that is going toward mortgages. Okay, so this table will not surprise anybody that has been paying attention to uh, the global financial crisis. And what it does is sort of uh, bring to the fore in which ways have countries leveraged up uh, in the last uh, 50 years. So basically what you have ranked from most leveraged to least leveraged, uh, starting with Spain, which is where I come from. Um, in column number one is you can see what the change in uh, total lending activity as a ratio to GDP from 1960 to 2010. And so if you look at the red number for Spain, that was basically 135%, which is a, an enormous amount. Uh, and if you, you can go down the list and look at, at the different countries. So the, the U.S. is about 0.7 uh, or 70%. Now, where did that, uh, that increase in leverage get uh, shifted toward? Well, uh, if you look at the bottom line that says share, uh, it will make it easier to read, but if you want to just look at what happened for each country, you can look at columns two and three. A lot of the lending activity that uh, we see going from 1960 to 2010 was going to real estate, as opposed to uh, what is unsecured lending, which we typically associate with business lending. Okay? Uh, in Spain, for example, to use that same example, uh, we have that out of that 135% increase, about 100% of that was real estate activity. Now, that real estate activity is going to include, part of it is commercial, part of it is uh, uh, households. And so if you look at columns four and five, you have that break them a little, a, little bit, a little bit more cleanly. So you can ask, well, how much of that mortgage lending really is commercial versus household? And so uh, that's what you have there. Uh, households now represent perhaps a little bit less, so 75% out of that 135% increase that I was discussing for Spain, um, a little bit more evenly distributed, now 60% for business. But at the end of the day, if you look on average over the 17 economists and you look at the bottom row of this table, uh, what is the takeaway? Well, the takeaway in both cases is that about 70% of this massive increase in lending that we experienced in the last 50 years really has gone toward uh, real estate and to households. And so uh, 
you know, that starts to resonate with uh, this whole idea of leveraging having increased dramatically over the fi last 50 years. Uh, mortgages becoming a much larger share in total lending than uh, we've ever seen. And, and here you have a much more fine, uh, detailed uh, breakdown of, of where those numbers come from. Now, what is the <coughs> consequence, at least partially, of that massive increase in mortgage? And well, presumably people are buying houses. So that should show up in uh, home ownership rates. But the way it shows up is in a very heterogeneous manner. And I'd like to bring you back to the uh, first sort of policy implication that I was discussing, uh, which is that countries have treated mortgages in very different ways and have treated home ownership and have used tax policy in very different ways uh, throughout uh, history. So let me walk you a little bit through the numbers in the table, especially focusing on Germany and Switzerland versus what has happened in the US, okay? So let's look at the US starting the 1900s, going all the way to basically World War II. And what you see is that the home ownership rate is about 50%, give or take. <coughs> Parenthetically, so, uh, you know, it's so fashionable nowadays to, to quote uh, from Capital, but not, not, I'm not going to quote from Piketty's book. I'm actually going to quote from the original, <coughs> Karl Mar Marx, uh, <laughs> Capital. And so, uh, uh, so there's uh, my author Moritz found out uh, uh, a data point there was was amazing to me. It said in 1863 uh, there were about 20 million households, uh, 20 million people in in uh, the UK. Uh, out of those 20 million, I think 36,000 people owned homes. So I guess that home ownership that is uh, you know less than one percent. So that, uh, well, that was 1863, so keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, now we're talking about the U.S. In the, in the, basically the end of World War II, we're talking about 50% home ownership rates. Um, now, with the Great Depression, um, and also with the GI Bill after World War II, there were a number of policy changes that had a tremendous impact in the incentives to own property. And as you can see, home ownership rates that had been pretty stable at about 50% now start creeping up. And they start creeping up to nearly 70% at the eve of the uh, housing bubble that uh, we just endured. That home ownership rate has come down a little bit, a smidgen, but uh, not a whole lot. Contrast that to what happened in Germany, which has a much more different uh, uh, tax treatment of mortgages. And in fact, the incentive there is not for owners, it, the incentive is for renters. And so what you see is that home ownership rates in Germany uh, have remained strikingly stable. So are about 40% in uh, at the end of World War II, and nowadays they're about 45%. So it's a 5% increase, okay? Uh, in Switzerland, you can see they, they have home ownership rates that haven't really moved very much uh, since uh, the end of World War II. Anyway, if you had looked at data for Italy, and I don't have the data for Spain here, but uh, in Spain, uh, for instance, you have one of the highest home ownership rates of second homes in the world. So in Spain, apparently, we have a fascination with bricks. Now, you could say, well, uh, maybe the reason that you're seeing more mortgage activity is because house prices are going up. And so, you know, that's just the concomitant uh, um, price movement. So that there's nothing magic about that. Yeah and no. So uh, in this graph, what I'm displaying for you is the ratio of total mortgage lending against the total housing stock for the U.S. Now, we don't actually have the data for uh, the loan-to-value ratios for all the loans. So that's what you would like to have, but at least this gives you a sense of how much leverage there is in terms of uh, mortgage activity. And so what you see there is pr a pretty unrelenting and then a fairly dramatic increase in the amount of leverage uh, that households are enduring uh, if you compare the amount that they're borrowing relative to the value of their homes. And so that is, is basically connecting the dots for the first takeaway of my story, which was uh, this is a new era. Um, this, is, this is something new, and this is something we should be paying attention to. Uh, I call it the democratization of leverage. Okay? Uh, and so increasingly, those that are least able to 
bear credit risk are those that are bearing the most credit risk. So going forward, if we are concerned or if we think that financial crises are things we should try to avoid, I think this will be one of the ingredients in the discussion. And in the talk about inequality, I think perhaps we need to keep that in mind. Um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll leave for more, uh, I'll leave that as an open question. I don't have an answer to that. But I think that, that at least knowing that this is going on in the world is perhaps an interesting thing uh, to start a discussion about. Okay. Now, more recently, and more directly related to the topic of the paper uh, that I'm presenting, uh, I suppose that especially some of you in the financial mm -hmm. industry might have noticed something about long-term interest rates, uh, especially those of you on a fixed income, maybe bemoaning what has happened to long-term interest rates. So what I have in that graph uh, is 10-year uh, uh, government securities for Germany, Japan, U.S., and um, U.K., and of course, uh, we're all very upset about how the Federal Reserve and uh, you know, other central banks have been keeping interest rates very, 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 very low, uh, especially in the last five to 10 years. But that is actually just part of a trend that has been true in the last uh, 30 years. Okay. So there's a sense in which part of it can be explained by the financial crisis, but not all. We have to think about has, what has happened um, in recent times. And it has been not something particular to the U.S., but actually something particular to all of these big advanced economies. Well, in current times, if you follow the press and you follow particularly what has happened in, in Sweden in the last few days, uh, you'll see that a lot of central bankers and uh, people in, uh, uh, in government are struggling with what I would call a policy dilemma. On the one hand, you're trying to uh, uh, loosen monetary policy to improve economic uh, um, activity. On the other hand, you're starting to see uh, froth in housing markets. In the UK, for instance, there's been quite a bit of tension between uh, programs that the uh, Cameron government has introduced to try to foster home ownership. That, in a sense, collab clashes with uh, you know, house, house uh, price values in London uh, really getting out of hand. In Sweden, there was a grave concern about house prices very early on. Interest rates went up, and then all of a sudden, uh, that, uh, the economy took a big hit, and now they're kind of reversing trend. They're starting to uh, introduce negative interest rates, just like Denmark did in recent times. So you can see that this is a topic that I don't think we've, we, we have a very good handle on, and it's, it's causing quite a bit of distress among central bankers. So one way to explain what we do in the paper is just to show you three graphs. And those three graphs tell the story, okay? So here's the story. You have a green line, that's for Ireland. You have a red line, that's for Spain. And you have a black line, that's for Germany. Okay, so graph number one is at the top. And what it shows you is what the Taylor rule would tell you interest rates should be in each of those countries. And then in a very faint way in blue, you see what the euro rate was. So what do you see? Well, you see that if you had monetary authority in Ireland, you would have chosen to have much, much higher interest rates than those imposed by the euro, uh, by the European Central Bank. The same thing goes for Spain, and the opposite goes for Germany. Although in the German case, it was pretty close to what uh, the ECB was um, doing at the time. So then you go to the bottom row and you have two graphs. On the left-hand side, you have what happened to mortgage activity, and on the right-hand side, you have what happened to prices. So it's perhaps not entirely surprising to then see that you know, uh, mortgage activity took off in Ireland and in Spain, <coughs> and basically stayed flat in Germany. And then if you look at what <coughs> happened to housing prices in Ireland and Spain, well, we all know what happened. What, what is the time period? Ah. You can't see that. It's from 1990 to 2010. Sorry. 
1999. It doesn't tell. <coughs> yes. So you could see what happened to housing prices in Germany. They're actually uh, coming down throughout all these periods, whereas they were going up um, pretty dramatically for Spain and Ireland. That's really the story of the paper. So if you understood those three graphs, that's, that's all you need to know. Okay, so more uh, precisely, what we're going to ask next is, okay, so we all can understand the mechanism that low interest rates feed into mortgages. You know, if you have to pay less every month on your mortgage payment, then you can afford a bigger mortgage, and presumably that affects housing prices. But the key question is, well, what, by how much? Right? I mean, we can all see the mechanism, but the, the, the key is the number. And then we, what we're going to ask is, okay, well, all these mortgage activity and all these house price depreciation, how should we think about it in terms of uh, how it affects the likelihood of a, of a financial crisis? So those are going to be the two questions that we're going to uh, ask more pointedly in the next few slides. And in order to do that, let me tell you some of the cool things we do in this paper, okay? So the cool thing number one is that we're really combining two new data sets. And one data set, in a sense, is an extension of the work that we've been doing over the last five years. We, Moritz and Alan started with credit, and then we expanded that to take a more granular way, uh, view of what's going on with credit. And we got data on, on mortgages and, and non, uh, unsecured lending and so on. The other part is, is, in a sense, getting data that Moritz and his graduate students have put together on housing prices. And that's also novel. Um, there was a lot of uh, house price data out there, especially in recent times, but it's, it's being a chore to sort of put this together for going back 140 years, and, and you'll see it's, there's a lot of ifs and buts in that data, and, and I'll hope to discuss a little bit what goes on there, but in a sense, that's what's uh, very new in the paper. The second thing that's, I thought, clever, I didn't come with it, so I can say it, it was clever, uh, was to say, well, okay, you know, uh, how are you going to figure out whether the movements in interest rates were something that the monetary authority was responding to versus, you know, basically, how are you going to separate uh, supply and demand? That's what it boils down to. Okay? And so what we did was say, okay, hang on. When there's a fixed exchange rate and free-flowing capital, then basically you lose control of your monetary policy. And when you do that, all of a sudden you've identified a source of exogenous variation in monetary conditions. Okay, so the trick here is most of the time you see interest rates move up and down and you can't really tell whether it's the monetary authority, authority responding to domestic economic conditions or whether you know, it's something else. Well, we really want to focus on the something else. And so we're going to use what is called in international finance the trilemma. That's going to be the source of our natural experiment, okay? So we're going to combine that with um, some methods that are called local projections and instr instrumental variables. And that's going to be the trick to quantify what happens on the supply side when you have this exogenous variation in interest rates and how it trickles down to mortgage rates and how it trickles down to uh, lending activity and eventually house prices. And then we're going to use some machine learning methods that I will teach you about uh, for how to think about when financial crises are going to be more or less likely. Okay, so uh, usually this, this is the kind of slide that I tell my grad students never to show because nobody ever wants to see a bunch of names and dates except there's a good reason why I put it up. Uh, one is to let you know what the two sources of the data are. Okay, so the two key papers that you want to focus on are there in the, in the top two bullet points. Second reason to put the, uh, um, the next set of papers, the ones that said nexus between monetary policy and house prices, is to make you aware that we're not the first ones to be discussing this sort of issue. And in fact, my discussion today is one of the contributors to this literature. So uh, I want to make you aware of that. And the third one is because you're Perhaps some of you are not familiar with the trilemma um, uh, in, in international finance. It's perhaps useful to know 
that this is a topic that has received quite a bit of interest in recent times, including my co-author, Alan Taylor, so you, now you can start to figure out what the clever bit was. Um, and, and, you know, anyway, uh, this goes back to the Mandel Fleming, but uh, in recent times you have quite a bit of work on, on this issue. Okay, so a look at the data. Data is not a nice, complete panel, 17 countries, you observe every year, you have data for everybody, and the sources are the same. It's, so it's nothing like that. It's, it's, it's quite dirty in some sense, in the sense that the samples are bigger for some countries, smaller for some other countries. When it comes to housing prices, the ideal would be to have a fixed plot of land and a uniform home and compare the price of that uniform plot of land at that uniform home and track that over history, and that's not reality. So the reality is quite different. There's a bit of heterogeneity in the uh, uh, structures that we are able to track prices for. And so, you know, you have to take uh, some caution in being too forceful in interpreting the house price data, but nevertheless, uh, this is as best we have at this moment. And you can see a little bit in the right-hand side column, uh, a little description of where the house price data comes from. Sometimes it's repeated sales, sometimes it comes from the OEC data, it's only most recent in 1970 to, to now. Right, sometimes we do have quite a bit of uh, historical data. So in France, we go back to 1870, and uh, you know, we have quite a bit of coverage. So, talk about the methods. So what is this trilemma? Fancy uh, Latin word, I guess. Uh, is the notion that Mandel and Fleming put together in 1962 or 63 in two papers that you cannot simultaneously have a fixed exchange rate, free flowing capital control, and monetary policy autonomy. You gotta choose two out of the three, but you cannot have all three, okay? And so in eras of the gold standard, in eras of fixed exchange rates, what's going to happen is that if you have fleet flowing capital controls, you won't have monetary autonomy. And that is what we're going to exploit as a source of a natural experiment. So, um, well that's great. We have now a source of, of, of autonomy, a uh, way to measure really the supply side of, of, of this channel as opposed to the demand side, which is great. Uh, but this is not what I would call a randomized control experiment. It's, it's a natural experiment, so it's not completely clean. So we're going to take a double insurance route. We're going to say, okay, let's focus the attention not on every single movement of interest rates, but only on those that are associated with the trilemma. And then let's bring in a set of rich controls to try to further clean up any variation in interest rates that could be explained by domestic conditions, okay? So that's going to be our double insurance. Now, um, over the entire span of the history that we analyze, what we have here is that the base country to which different countries have pegged their exchange rates, either directly through the gold standard or through Bretton Woods arrangements or through other measures, uh, has varied over time. And so the base country also has varied over time. Uh, and there you have in the table basically what we've uh, decided to do in terms of defining what the base country was and what the countries in our data were going to be uh, following. And so that's a, bit, a, a broad summary that basically uses uh, existing sources cited at the top of the table. So here's a simple way of assessing how good this trilemma natural experiment is. And so what you have here is a scatter plot. And on the vertical axis, what you have is the change in uh, basically the local interest rate. And on the horizontal axis, what you have is the change in the base country interest rate. And to the extent that there is a positive correlation, basically you've identified movements in interest rates that are coming from the uh, base country and can presumably be used in this natural experiment. Every other movement that is not explained by uh, the base country exchange rate, then that, that we're going to, in essence, throw away. So the first takeaway is, yes, this actually seems to work. It seems to pick up quite a bit of variation in interest rates that could be presumably uh, uh, um, 
attached to movements that are not explained by uh, domestic economic conditions. At the bottom of the slide, you have the equation that would be, uh, for those on the know, the first stage regression in a two-stage least squares uh, experiment. And what's critical about this instrument is that you actually need to interact whether you're in exchange rate peg with whether or not you have uh, open capital uh, or free flowing capital controls. Because remember, the trilemma requires the two conditions to be functioning at the same time. OK. So here's the main result. Uh, this is the way to read uh, the mechanics of the black box of how we put the data together, how we use the natural experiment, and how we think about uh, identifying these movements in uh, interest rates and how it channels through the different uh, variables. So the top left-hand side panel defines our experiment. It basically says in year zero, you're going to reduce interest rates by 100 basis points, or 1%. That in itself has a particular dynamic. It will just basically eventually move back to zero, but slowly, as you can see. So by year four, uh, you're back to you know, uh, cumulative change of uh, 50 basis points only. These are cumulative changes, OK? That makes long-term rates move. But they don't move one to one because there are risk premia. There are all sorts of other factors. And in fact, this sort of non one to one movement of interest rates at the short end of the yield curve to the long yield of the to the long end of the yield curve is pretty common. So in that respect, our analysis is already matching what we know about the yield curve. The more interesting pictures are the bottom row. So the bottom left tells you what happens to mortgages, and the bottom right tells you what happens to prices. So mortgages are mortgages as a ratio to GDP. And so basically it's saying in year zero, not a whole lot happens. But by year four, the cumulative change in lending activity is a change of about between two and three percentage points. And that's quite a bit if you think about it. Now, if you look at what happens to house prices as a ratio to income, which is the <clears throat> bottom row, excuse me, right-hand side uh, graph, what you see is that <clears throat> there's quite a bit of sensitivity of house prices uh, in response to all that mortgage activity and all that uh, uh, decline in interest rates. So that, in a sense, is uh, fairly substantial evidence that, yes, indeed, interest rates have a fairly strong effect on mortgage activity and housing prices. And here's a number we can attach to those movements that we can use later on. OK. Um, I'm going to go very quickly, since I don't have much time, just to tell you that you actually need to be careful about using this natural experiment or an instrument, and also the need for controlling for domestic economic activity. One without the other doesn't work. You have an attenuation bias that is visible for those of you who have very quick eyes, because I'm going to move to the next table. Basically, what's going to happen is the numbers in red get smaller than the numbers in black. So you cannot live without the natural experiment. You cannot live without the controls. OK, main result number two, and I'm almost done. So basic takeaway. Yes, mortgage activity and housing prices seem to be associated with a higher likelihood of, of having a financial crisis. It's very far from predicting financial crisis. So at best, all I can say is, it seems to be one of the many factors that affects the likelihood of financial crisis, but it's definitely not the only one. OK. So remember, there were three takeaways in this paper. Okay. The changing role in banking. There's a lot more mortgage activity as a ratio to uh, the total share of lending activity, going from one third to two thirds. We think that that has important implications for uh, policy more broadly, and I'm going to leave that uh, uh, more discussion. The two other points that are really the, the, the core of the paper is that, yes, over the business cycle, such as movements in short-term rates are going to trickle down to house prices through the usual channels. No surprise there, but we have a number for that. And yes, mortgage activity and housing prices actually matter for the likelihood of financial crisis. When households are more leveraged and there's a housing boom, that's trouble. Okay.
a couple of caveats and you know preview of, of future work. And the caveat is that this is we're finding that this is a very asymmetric effect. The Fed really, or the central bank, is not as powerful in stimulating the economy and generating a house price boom as it is in reining everything in. Okay, so there's a very big asymmetry in the way we think about how the central bank affects housing and mortgage activity. The other thing is we haven't said anything about microprudential tools, and so there's a lot there to be uh, thought about, and, uh, about how those interact with this general mechanism. And just to just preview some of the uh, coming attractions, we have some work on asset price booms and leverage, basically uh, showing you that those two are a very dangerous combination. So asset price booms alone are okay. Leverage alone, less okay, but okay. Those two in combination, bad idea. So keep an eye on that. And so I'll leave uh, the table for Mike, uh, just that in the longer run, we need to have a bigger thought about what is the role of leverage and what is the role of leverage in, in discussions <coughs> of inequality. And we just have scratched the surface with this paper in a particular segment of the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh The discussant is uh, uh, Michael Bodo from Rutgers University. Why am I? <coughs> Where's my presentation? This is a, it's a very interesting paper. Uh, it provides uh, empirical evidence on the role of expansionary monetary policy in, in generating uh, credit booms and house price booms. And, that can, and the booms can, can burst and lead to financial crises. So the paper, which combines um, theory, history, and empirics, is one of a series of papers by, by these authors. And I've actually discussed I think three done this three or four times so it's almost like we're a tag team they they give a paper somewhere NBER someplace they invite me to give to discuss them so this is it's been a lot of fun I sort of it's like a moving average and I've been following their work uh, very closely um, so the value added of the paper is uh, is several fold and uh, Oscar's already told you about that it provides a new multi-country database on house prices and mortgage credit, and it goes back for some countries to 1870. So this is really good. This is, a, 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 for me, a very important uh, contribution. Secondly, it develops, as Oscar said, a compelling strategy based on Mondell's trilemma to identify exogenous changes in monetary policy. And the third is it uses a me an econometric method that developed by Oscar uh, called the local projections approach to demonstrate the dynamic uh, mechanism that links expansionary monetary policy to housing booms uh, through changes in short-term interest rates and changes in long-term rates and increases in mortgage credit. And fourth, it uses a new methodology to ascertain the probability that house price booms are going to lead to financial crises. And, and the bottom line of the paper is that um, and is that monetary policy does lead to credit booms and, and asset price booms, and that agrees with work that I've done and other people have done. So I really don't have an issue with, with the bottom line of the paper, that expansionary monetary policy can lead to house price booms, and that can lead to crises. But there are, I do have a number of issues with the details of the paper, and Oscar spent most of the time talking about the big picture and not as much going into the paper, and I'm, I read the paper, and I'm going to really comment on the details of the paper. So for some of you that, that, were, that, that didn't get the details, you'll have to read the paper. So the first thing is, I, I mean, is, is the, the, the trilemma. So I really think that I like the, their use of the trilemma. 
I think it's a nice identifying strategy, but there's still an issue that needs to be clarified. So they use, what they do is they use the change in the base country's interest rate, uh, base country being UK on the gold standard, US in the Bretton Woods period, and Germany for Europe in the, in the post-1970 period. So they use that and they, they take the interest rate, they multiply it by, by two dummy variables, one uh, to tell you whether you're, you're on a, a peg, pegged exchange rate, and secondly, whether you have capital controls. And that gives you an instrument, as, as Oscar said. And, and, and the idea of this is to instrument out um, home country factors that are causing changes in local rates um, and, and leaving exogenous changes in the home rate. And they reasonably assume that the home country in the, in the, in the, under the gold standard was in the 19th century was Great Britain. In the interwar, they take a mix between Britain France and Germany. I would throw France out of it and kept Germany and, and uh, sorry, uh, Britain, France, and, and, and the U.S. I just have the U.S. Uh, and, and, um, and Britain in there. And then uh, in the Bretton Woods periods, it's the U.S. dollar. And then in the post where they focus on, on Europe and they think it's, the, it's, it's Germany. Um, and I think that the, for the first two regimes, that's okay. Uh, for, the Europe, for Europe, they assumed that Germany was the base country. Um, and the assumption is that German um, interest rates, short-term rates, might be, uh, might, are, are supposed to be exogenous. But actually, all these European rates are tied together. And if you have a change in the demand for private housing right across Europe, um, which they talk about in the paper, then really it's hard to think of the German rate as being as being really exogenous. So I, I have a, a quibble with that. Um, but um, especially in, the, in, 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 in recent years. The second comment is about the use of economic history. And the paper sort of is said to be a, 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 a use of a paper about economic history. And this is a bet more that I've raised in all, on the comments of all the papers that have that been written by these guys. Um, and, and the point is, there's really no history in the paper other than the use of historical data. There are no narratives on the monetary policy actions that were taken. There's nothing, no discussion of the institutions related to mortgage credit or the house price booms or the financial crises. Um, the second comment is, it's really not clear, if you go through, look carefully at the paper, what the value added of the historical evidence pre-World War II really is to the overall results. And most of the action on credit and house price booms is post-World War II, and more specifically, post-1973. And you can see that in figure one of their paper. Um, and moreover, the econometric evidence that they have in the paper for the pre-World War II period uh, and pre-World pre War II is generally weaker than it is for the post-war. And then if you look at pre-World War I, it's very weak. And so my, my real question is, why do we need that data? I mean, we need it to give them degrees of freedom, but really, I don't get much out of that uh, long sweep of history story. Um, and then in, in my, uh, my paper with, with, with John Landon Lane uh, a year or so ago, we found that house price booms differed considerably across countries, especially before World War II. Well, it's hard to claim that these booms are similar um, which is one of the underlying assumptions that you have in pooling the housing booms data, the housing boom data across time and across countries. And when you do that, you question the validity of the panel assumptions. My third comment is about the local projections method that um, Oscar spent a little time explaining. And it's not clear whether these impulse response functions that they look like have a structural interpretation or not because um, what's, whether you have a structural interpretation, that's based on what, the va what variables are excluded from the estimated equation. And what, what they do is they, they prefer to let the data decide which variables to exclude, but they don't report the estimation results at all. So what you really want, you really want to know what they did to see what's sort of behind that black box before you can really understand it. <clears throat> and lastly, I'm going to talk for a little while uh, about housing related issues. Um, and Oscar in his comments talked about that, but it's not in the paper. 
Um, so there, 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 there are key differences across countries in mortgage systems and housing supply. Um, and they're supposed to be controlled for using uh, fixed effects. But the changes in policy are not directly controlled for. And hence the study finds that the response of house prices to monetary shocks is different over different sample periods. And they, and they acknowledge this in the paper. But no, it's OK. I, I mean, you know, it's all right. I mean, they're just, they're just it's basically, um, it's basically t telling the same story. So the analysis in the, the, analysis in the paper um, I think has some shortcomings. And the first is that because of the large uh, transactions costs and the time for households to move, um, <clears throat> house price movements are serially correlated and they reflect incomplete short run adjustment. But the models that are used in the paper are first differences and they don't include the lag levels of variables to control for partial adjustment. And simply including a number of, of, of lag first differences uh, really obscures periods when prices are close to long run equilibrium levels from those when they're not. Um, the second problem is that the, the models that they do, they omit housing supply, tax policy, and, and regulatory differences over time and across countries. And so the, the paper makes statements um, that you can't control for all factors affecting house prices, but they really gloss over how the fit of the house price models that they have in their table five, are, that they really aren't very strong. And so, so more importantly, um, these omitted factors might, might matter at a much deeper level, and they might have implications for how to interpret the results. So for example, um, the impact of monetary policy on house price to income and mortgage debt to income ratios can, can plausibly reflect differences in underlying housing supply and regular to, regulatory policies, policies over time and across countries. So the US, and he talked about this a little bit, which, which has a more elastic supply of owner-occupied housing, and Germany, which gives large tax advantages to rent it, rent it, rental over owner-occupied houses, they're going to have different, they have different long run time paths of house price to income ratios than do many of the other countries. So in general, like long run swings in house prices are more pronounced in countries or regions of the U.S. with more inelastic housing supply. But in the short run, the more pronounced overbuilding cycles um, in more supply elastic countries like the US and Spain, that can also have implications for how long business housing busts can, can last versus countries which, had, which have restrictive supply like the UK. So this, these issues I think uh, really should be, uh, should be addressed uh, in the paper. And my last comment <coughs> is about policy issues. So the paper, and, and Oscar mentioned this at the end, but, di but didn't really go into it. The paper makes some strong statements about the need for macroprudential uh, policy without analyzing the differences across countries and over time. And if you look across countries, okay, some studies argue that, that poor regulatory policy or the lack of effective supervision were reasons why the U.S. and Ireland and Spain had more, uh, suffered more from the housing bust than countries whose mortgage markets were also relatively uh, liberalized, like the U.K. Uh, and Netherlands and Denmark. And so, um, so that's a problem. And also, regulatory policies can change within countries. So for example, the U.S. mortgage rates adjusted for lagged house price appreciations were low in both the late 1970s and the mid 2000s, and yet loan to value ratios for first time buyers are much lower in the earlier bank dominated period than in the later period when regular, regulatory policy allowed securitization uh, to fund subprime lending. And so the, the former period you didn't have a big run up in, in foreclosures and in the latter period you did. Um, 
So unless uh, monetary policy shocks and regulation and housing supply are, 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 are explicitly tracked, you can get a very incomplete picture of how monetary and regulatory policy affects house prices, mortgage debt, and the real, e real economy. And so, for example, more restrictive mortgage regulatory policy can plausibly reduce the impact of monetary policy shocks on the overall economy and the housing sector. And that has implications for whether monetary policy reaction functions would change if regulation changed. So for example, would monetary policy in the US be more stimulative in response to operating in a more restrictive lending environment? I mean, like now the, the Dodd-Frank era. And if so, would macro prudential policies necessarily increase financial stability if swings in monetary policy become more pronounced in reaction? So the paper ends by making a very reasonable statement. It says, macroeconomic history refutes the notion that the joint objectives of macroeconomic stabilization and financial stability can be examined in isolation. Um, this is somewhat ironic because the paper doesn't really talk about control for regulation across countries and over time. So I think that this, this is something that needs a lot of work. But in general, I, I mean, I, I, I like the paper. I think um, I, I like the whole research project. It's very exciting. They've added on a lot of data um, and they put it, they, they, they packaged everything very well. And, they, and I think this is important work. So I, I congratulate the authors, but I think that they, I mean, obviously there's always room for improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> So uh, given the time, so let's uh, skip the response. So uh, uh, let's open the floor to the audience. So uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, Oscar, if you want, to, you, you can use the you know, Q&A session to uh, address some of the comments <laughs> in the meantime, I think. I'll, I'll take one minute. And um, okay. I think I can summarize Mike's comments uh, with the following example. When you do a randomized control experiment with a, uh, a pharmaceutical or, or a medicine, um, you know, what you're trying to do is basically compare a group that, uh, uh, that gets the placebo with a group that gets the medicine. But the group that gets the medicine or the group that gets the placebo is very heterogeneous. Okay, so what we're measuring basically is an average effect of the medicine. Now, if you go to the doctor and say, you know, do I need to take that medicine? Then the doctor's going to say, well, are you diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in other words, he's going to tailor the medication to your condition. Well, I think what Mike is saying is, well, you guys have done the randomized control experiment. So you know, on average, the medication works. But you know, economic history is about looking at the patient in detail. So you haven't told me. You know, uh, Germany in 1929, you know, was diabetic and had high blood pressure and so on and so forth. And so maybe the stories that you're telling us, on average, don't apply to Germany. And you know, he's quite correct with that. That would be my response. <laughs> Great. Uh. I have a quick, rather technical question or observation which is that uh, the way, if I understood correctly, the way you identify the monetary policy shocks, uh, suppose you have two countries, you would say it's a monetary part, you, I'm back to the other country, and the other country changes its monetary policy, and so I have to change my own monetary policy. And the, the effect of that will be different than if I'm on my own, and I decide to change my monetary policy because my exchange rate will appreciate. We'll do monetary policy on my own, not together with the other country. So, so you haven't identified the effects of autonomous monetary policy, if I understood correctly. Right. So that's the, that's the strategy. So when you're pegged and you have free-flowing capital controls, then you lose that, that lever. Right. But the, the effect that you're identifying is different from saying, say, I'm the U.S. and I increase interest rates or I decrease interest rates because the U.S. is not pegged to anybody. All right. Sure. So, so uh, but, but that's the whole point in a sense. So the U.S. would be responding endogenously to domestic economic conditions. Uh, 
exchange rate would be allowed to change in that experiment, not in the experiment that you're doing. But it's not just an identification. It's just that you're looking at the effect of a different policy. Ah, ah, ah. You're saying that... Uh, uh, cannot use your effects to, to conclude what would be the effects of a change in monetary policy in the U.S. that has a floating exchange rate. That's all I'm saying. Ah, right, right. I agree. Thank you. A very interesting talk. Um, you asked, you said there is no uh, opportunity to look at a uh, set piece of, uh, of so many houses built over time, what happened over the years. Actually, in Amsterdam, uh, in the beginning of the 17th century, when they expanded excessively, they built houses, and the prices have been known uh, and the regulatory policies and mortgages, and that all is known. So if you want to look for something that is much cleaner, but historically much longer um, in the Netherlands, that's... Uh, that's right. So the data in the Netherlands is actually quite good for Amsterdam. But not, so, so there's two problems. One is um, when you do a house price index for a country, mm -hmm. then you, you need also... Uh, data on different big population areas. So in the Netherlands, Amsterdam has really tremendous data, but then it's a lot harder, for example, to get data for other, and then you know, from that construct the index for the Netherlands. So in, in the particular case of the Netherlands, I think it's primarily Amsterdam data. Jim, and I found both of these papers fascinating, and I enjoyed them a great deal. We know that low interest rates are likely to stimulate demand, but of course, as economists, we know that prices only go up when there's some kind of constraint on supply. Uh, the real price of cars, motor vehicles, for example, hasn't changed a great deal in response to easy monetary policy. Um, I, I wonder how you, and, and Michael Bordo made this point about supply constraints, Looking at the United States, we see a, a classic example of where, in some areas, house prices went up very strongly indeed, and in other areas, they have not gone up very strongly. And it'd be interesting to compare San Francisco, where I gather you are, yourself are based, Oscar, uh, with prices in, let's say, Houston, uh, where the supply constraints are much less tight. Uh, would that produce a different set of reactions? I think that this goes back to the issue of heterogeneity. Um, that Mike was alluding to, and I tried to explain with my medical example. And, um, and the, but there's another dimension in which perhaps it's useful to make a more nuanced point, and that is that uh, the effects that we're measuring, in a sense, I would consider them sort of business cycle frequency events. Um, you know, uh, over time, you would expect that municipalities would perhaps decide to open up tracts of land to building and so forth as demand built up, and that will release pressure on house prices. So I would consider this more of a sort of a short-term effect that we have measured, uh, as opposed to if you were to say something about the next 10 <coughs> or 15 years. Okay, and so that, in a sense, connects well to a point that uh, Mike was making about uh, what happens to regulation changes in regulation in response to what's going on in the economy. I think all those factors uh, uh, could be considered sort of more medium-term effects. You don't expect agents to remain standing in the face of changing environment. And so uh, I would stress that these are sort of you know, effects that we can really measure very well in the short run, one to four years. Uh, going further out, then the whole environment starts to change, and then it's a lot harder to, to measure what the net effect might be. So in explaining house price bubbles or long run trends, both theory and data would suggest that a very important change was that when I bought a house, I had to put 35% down. And as you know, for some 20 million Americans, that went to about zero. This has nothing to do with interest rates at all. Where would that story fit in to 
the trend that you've been talking about? Does it complement the lower interest rate story over this 30 or 40 years, or is it totally different? Um, it definitely affects it, uh, and I think it's, it's part of the story of what you saw in terms of the, the uh, rub in, in housing. Uh, another story that you could add is, is not only that, but mortgage securitization is probably the instrument that was primarily used to, to basically end up with uh, uh, um, no down payment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all those factors are definitely contributing. Um, and again, I would consider those along the lines of what I was mentioning. There's the sort of long run, medium run, short run perspectives on this problem. And I think what we've identified with the graphs that I showed there are uh, very well the short run, but the sort of medium run where you could have regulation changing the amount of down payment that you need, the, those are a little murkier. I had a question for Mike. You, you brought up a point about uh, macroprudential policies possibly creating more volatility than they stop in the sense in volatility for policy. Is that something that has been written about and discussed in the sense that I think you were getting at, which is that if we design all these macroprudential policies to sort of limit leverage during business cycles, then the actual power of monetary policy to influence aggregate demand is diminished, which requires more aggressive moves in monetary policy to get the desired output, inflation, and unemployment result. Is that something that's kind of out there that people are writing about? Because I haven't seen that before. It sounds very interesting. I mean, people are thinking about it, but it's still, I mean, I think this is a, a pitfall in, in the, in the um, in, in, in the move by many central banks to to adopt macro prudential policy, okay, uh, I think that it's um, that there are some real risks that they're taking on, um, and that they don't know what they are yet. But this is one of them, um, and so they think they can they can somehow or other by adding on another policy tool or set of tools that they can solve a, a problem, okay, a problem of financial stability which has been elevated supposedly the same level as price stability. And somehow or other, they're going to have that under control, and they can also give you price stability. Okay, and I'm not convinced they can do that, okay. In fact, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I really think that there is a problem of when you add on more policy, you know, more policy tools and more policy goals, you complicate monetary policy, and you, and you detract it from the main message, which, which to me is, is, is price stability. So this is like this is this is part of the of the of the conversation that's going on now amongst central banks, and likely the way it will be resolved is when something happens, they've taken on these tools and they find out wait a minute it backfires. Say so the views, views expressed by Mike and by me do not represent the views of the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> In any way. <laughs> so we have last question uh, before the break there. Not by us. Uh, um, I think the question would be better addressed to the previous panel on that <laughs> respect. So maybe. Uh, or lunch, they can tell you what the answer is. I, I don't have a, a good handle on that. All right, great. Uh, this is a great discussion. So let's uh, thank uh, Oscar and Michael again for the excellent presentation and discussion.